So I mentioned to you uh, earlier today, we're going to step away for a moment from the topic of our day, which is public education, uh, and focus on a related but different topic, higher education, although some people in this audience would probably argue that we ought to be defining education these days as pre-K through 16, so maybe it's all of a piece. But in any case, we're going to uh, spend the next little while talking about higher ed. Uh, our midday program is a conversation with David Lebron, the president of Rice University, whose hospitality, as I've said a couple times, made it possible for us to be here today. Several months ago, when we began planning our day on this campus, I asked if the president would give us an hour or so to answer questions about the state of higher education, as well as the state of Rice in its centennial year, the successes he and this iconic institution have enjoyed, as well as the unresolved issues they face in these undeniably interesting times much as we have done with the leaders of other colleges and universities when we visited their campuses and much as we do on a regular basis back in Austin. And he kindly agreed. So I'm looking forward to a deep dive on matters that impact all of us here and across Texas. President LeBron, you may know, is only the seventh president in Rice's illustrious history. He assumed his post on June 1, 2004, after 15 years at Columbia University's law school, including eight as dean. During his tenure at Rice, President LeBron has presided over a 30% increase in undergraduate enrollment and a doubling of applications for admission, $800 million or more, perhaps by this point, in construction projects, the expansion of study abroad programs, and a strengthening of the university's relationship with the city of Houston, among other enviable accomplishments. A native of Philadelphia, he has an undergraduate degree and a law degree from Harvard University, where he was elected president of the Law Review. Please join me in welcoming President David LeBron. Thank you, sir. Put you on the floor side. President, thank you for having us and thank you for being here. Well, thank you for coming here and talking about the critically important issues in education. Well, thank you. And let, let's talk about the critically important issues of higher ed through the Rice lens for a little while before we invite the audience to join us. We'll have a bit of time to talk. So it is the centennial. Uh, here. You've spent many months and weeks celebrating uh, the history of this institution. What is the takeaway that those of us who may not spend time every day on this campus uh, should have from, from this centennial celebration about your view of Rice's place in the world today? Well, I think we've uh, achieved a remarkable amount, not only the la over the century, of course, yeah. but even over the last 50 years, over the, over the last 10 years. When Rice started out, it started out with an ambitious vision in a place that at that time people thought was not the right place in many ways for an institution of higher education yeah. with great ambition. Our founding president, Edgar O'Dell Lovett, had toured the world, visiting the best institutions in the world. And of course, he ended up leading the institution for almost 40 years, really, and laid the groundwork, which has enabled us to, to make even further progress. So, in the meantime, we've become, we think, of course, one of the best uh, universities in the United States, a real place in the world, some fundamental contributions, for example, in areas like nanotechnology, but especially proud of what we do for the education of young women and men. Right. And the, the increase in the enrollment that I uh, described to you, th that's something that has to come after careful consideration. You don't grow the campus or the enrollment that size without a lot of strategic planning about what the implications of that would be. Yeah, and we, we still think of ourselves as a distinctively small research university. Right. You compare us to other research universities. We're really one of the smallest, more or less full spectrum research universities. But we put such emphasis on the education of our students, particularly the education of our undergraduate students. It was important to us to remain comparatively small. I think what's hard to predict is you're undertaking these changes, a 30% expansion of the student body, in a very dynamic environment. And so when, if you compare what was going on when we started this expansion yeah. to the environment of today, those are really quite different environments. What's the biggest change? Um, you know, there are a lot. I mean, the, the, the coming sort of technological wave, which yeah. is going to alter the landscape of higher education, the wave hasn't quite hit the shores yet, but it's going to, and as others have said, it's going to be a bit of a tsunami. The financing of higher education has changed pretty radically. Right. The expectations of financial return on the endowment, the rates of tuition 
increases, the role that the federal government is going to be playing in financing research in higher education. And the third thing I, I would actually say is the way that both uh, politicians and the public look at higher education. Right. Yeah, l let's start there, because there are many external factors that affect the work that an institution like this one does that have nothing at all to do with the institution per se. There's the economy. You didn't mention the economy, but of course, in the time that you've been <coughs> president of Rice, the economy has gone up and down, and it's now starting to come back up, and that has to impact the way that you look at your world, the kind of projects that you might put money into or perhaps delay putting money into? Yeah, well, for us, uh, as an unusually endowment-dependent university, so if you look at our overall budget, yep. nearly half, a little less than half, uh, is supported by the payout from the endowment. And so when you have markets declining and changes in expectations about future returns, yep. that has a very big effect on us. Other institutions might be more affected by the change in student demand or the ability of families to pay for the education. But if you look at really all of the... And it's not cheap to come to Rice. That's, no, that's, it's, uh, we are consistently uh, one of the best values in the United States. Right. Some of that is because our tuition is lower than most of our peers and our financial aid policies are more aggressive than a lot of our peers. So it's very good value to come to Rice but the cost of higher education, you know, for the sticker price of higher education, tuition alone, um, is going to be somewhere between, in our case, about 140 some thousand dollars up to the high end, 160, 180,000. For a four year. For a four 180,000 dollars for a four year, four -year education. Degree. You know, the conversation you re referred to, the discussion uh, uh, taking place out in the world, politicians and others have of higher ed in its place. You hear a lot about price versus cost these days. Um, what students are being asked or families are being asked to pay versus the value of that education. Obviously, that conversation has one cast when you're talking about public universities. Another in the case of, of, of privates. T talk a bit about that. How do you, how do you measure the value of the education versus the cost? Well, almost every study that's been done has shown that um, really very high value, very high return on investment in higher education and whether you measure that, for example, by the additional income, which is more than a million dollars lifetime, or a much lower unemployment rate among those with college degrees, the evidence is pretty much unequivocal on that point. But to give you an example of how to understand private higher education, at least our part of prior high, uh, higher education, there's a range of uh, institutions. You have to remember there are over 4,000 institutions of higher education in the United States, and they really uh, form part of, a, part of a very broad and diverse spectrum. But let's take Rice as an example. So when we determined our cost, not the price, but our cost of providing the undergraduate education that we provide to our students, that's on the order of about $70,000. Of that amount, we charge about half that, $35,000 or so, in tuition. And of that amount, we collect, because of scholarships and other support, about one half of that. So in effect, we collect one-fourth of the cost of us providing. Subsidize the other three quarters. Yes. So it's a little odd. I mean, we recognize the burden that the costs of education place on families. On the other hand, one ought to recognize where else uh, do you have a product in which the demand is overwhelming. That is, we have 15,000 applications for 950 slots. And the price is one-fourth of your cost yeah. on, on average. So higher education is expensive, but it, in many ways, is an extreme value proposition, yeah. at least for schools like Rice and similar schools. The discussion of price versus cost in the public university arena has a flip side, and that's financial efficiency. You hear a lot these days in the discussions <coughs> of higher education reform about whether universities are being judicious in their use of the few resources they have. Talk about where, because the privates and the publics are obviously quite different in the way they approach this stuff. There, there is, but you know, it, it's funny because when you abstractly say efficiency, everybody says we should be more efficient, and, and what does that really no mean? No one's against efficiency. No one's against efficiency in theory, but what does it really mean? Well, the, the principal driver of efficiency in a college and university is the student faculty ratio. And to give you an example, when we put forth our plans to expand. Uh, the size of the student body, the first thing that people started saying to me was, well, you're not going to change your, at that point, five to one student faculty ratio, are you? 
And the answer was, well, we'll probably change it just a little bit. So I think we have to be careful what people really want because it is that sense of intimacy and relationships with professors and the relationship with the fellow students and the supporting of student organizations. All the things which, in fact, make us inefficient in the eyes of many are what are really integral to the value proposition that we offer. And it's not just what occurs in the classroom. And that huge demands put on us for an increasing level of services across the campus. Uh, right. You know, we built just over there a new recreation center. Doesn't have any of those really fancy things like lazy rivers and rock climbing walls and those things. We don't have those. But the physical fitness of our students and our staff and our faculty is actually extremely important. Right. I think what people sometimes forget is a university like ours is really like a small city. We have a police force, we have a transportation system, we have health services, we have lodging, we have restaurants, we have all of those things right. that go into a city. And so when people look at the tuition and they say, oh, is that what you're paying for the classes? No, you're paying that for an entire environment. You're paying experience. it for residency in the city. In effect, and all of that, all that, that relationship with other people right. engaged in that common project. But, it, but you know, we live in a state that is adding 1,000 people a day by most estimates that went from 20 million to 26 and a half million or more citizens today. And we are seeing the stresses on the state of that growth without an adequate investment of resources underneath it. You're talking about increasing the size of Rice City by 30% over the space of eight years. How is it possible that there's not been a cost to go along with the benefit? How have the stresses not manifested well, themselves there, on the experience yeah. of being I here. mean, there have been uh, certain stresses, and some of it, though, comes not because of expansion, but because of shifts in student demand. I'll give you one example. Yeah. One thing that happens when the economy collapses, the students get a lot more interested in economics. So you see many more students wanting to take economic courses. I think that's a good thing, but it takes us a while to respond to that kind of shift in demand. I would have assumed that people uh, respond to the economy by saying, I want to hang around in school longer. <laughs> so that, in fact, rather than seeing a particular interest in a discipline, you see people say, I'm going to push my degree out four years. We, we, this is a phenomenon, as you well know, that's bedeviling the public universities. They can't get kids through the pipeline quickly enough. Are you having a similar problem here? No, our, our students graduate pretty regularly. Uh, Probably at these prices, uh, they're happy to do it, right? Uh, although, actually, you know, it's funny because our students, we're very generous uh, with advanced placement. It's very easy for a Rice student, really, to come in and graduate in three years. But almost none of them want to do that. They find this such an enriching experience that they can stay the four years. But you know, the, some of the arch architecture students, athletes, yeah. sometimes the engineers, uh, they sometimes need a slightly longer period to complete their, their education. But basically, our students, they go to class, they do well. By and large, they find jobs. And I think, again, what we have to recognize is you know, we're a relatively small institution at a particular point on the educational spectrum. If you're looking at the state of Texas and what we're going to do about higher education in the future, I think one area where we all really do need to focus is the community colleges. Uh, the community colleges offer really the opportunity at, at low cost to give people an option on higher education. And we have to make those colleges right. more effective and I think support them more strongly in order to enable large numbers of students to get more of the education. It's an entry point. And as the it's population an, grows and we need more entry points, it's another part of the conversation. It's an entry point, and it helps support, I think, a very important piece of the vision of America, which is that this is not a society in which you have to be sort of born into the highest levels or you have to sort of make certain achievements by a certain point in your life. One of the truly remarkable things about this country is that wherever you are, if you dedicate yourself and succeed, you have another opportunity. So I'm very proud of the fact that we take students every year who have come from a community college right. to Rice. And that's a very different set of opportunities they're likely to have. But their entry point was the community college. And that's not a large number for us. But overall, that if you really want to say, how do you transform the state of Texas and what we can do in higher education, in my view, that needs to be That's a big piece of, way. of it. You've alluded a couple times to the way students are different or how st the profile of a typical student has changed. I want to ask you about technology, which you mentioned earlier in a second, but I want to start with demographic change. We live in a state that is hurtling 
inexorably toward Hispanic majority status. Um, we were faster as a minority majority state than some of, the, of, of our great illustrious demographers predicted, and we'll probably be faster to being a Hispanic majority than the demographers are predicting as well. That will have an enormous impact on the public universities, certainly, but I suspect on the profile of your applicant class year over year, as so many Texas kids want to go to the very best schools but stay in the state. Yeah, I mean, we've actually seen a dramatic change even in the past eight years or so. Our student body yeah. has no majority in it. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it's about 11% of our undergraduate student body are now international students. Yeah. And then if you, about uh, 40, 40 percent, less than 40 percent, are Anglo's, and the rest are areas. So it's a minority call, majority campus. And it, yeah. uh, and you know, sometimes people look at this and they they uh, think there's a political correctness or something. This is really what our students expect and they demand, and it's preparing them for the future. Having a diverse student body along every dimension. It's not just race and ethnicity. It's also religion and political views and Sex, geography. Sexual orientation, it's, right? It's everything that is going to really reflect the world they are going to inhabit. Right. And their ability to communicate with people and understand different perspectives is going to play a pretty big role in the success they're going to have. So from an administrative standpoint, what does this do to your perception of how the university needs to be organized or run? What does it uh, do to your thought about the course of study? What does it do to your thought about helping kids go from rice to the world of work. How does it transform your view of this university? Well, I think it's challenging. I mean, we had, in our, our last entering class, almost 19% Pell Grant recipients, which for universities like ours is really one of the, one high. of the highest, yeah. right? And so you're getting students from all kinds of different backgrounds and preparation, and you really have to think pretty carefully that these are remarkably talented students. But a student who comes out of a rural public high school yep. is not prepared the same way as a student in a big city elite private school. And again, part of what we provide is opportunity recognizing potential. So one of the first things we have to look at is not just can they succeed here, but what are the things that we can do to help them succeed here? Yeah. Now the technology question really comes together with this part of your question about what does it take really to make them successful in the world, and as I just said, a piece of that is putting them together with remarkably talented groups, classmates. I, I sometimes like to say to the students that the tuition we charge is actually for the privilege of spending four years with each other and the education we throw in for free. Right. And even if that was membership the case, in a club, it's right? a it's a very good deal. This incredibly diverse, talented group of students, where people for sometimes for the first time, even in the United States of today are meeting people of such different backgrounds and perspectives, right. again, across any of these dimensions. But with this sort of tidal wave of technology coming in, what this really means, and all the questions about the value of higher education, it really means that a lot of what we provide outside the classroom, mm -hmm. whether that's communication and leadership training, those opportunities to start student organizations, run student businesses, get out into the city, be engaged with the city, travel abroad, that all of those things actually become fairly central rather than peripheral to their educational experience. Now, when I think of technology these days, I think of a lot of um, distance learning or these massive online open courses, MOOCs that have suddenly become so popular. I noticed that in the last seven days or so, Rice joined the edX initiative that the University of Texas, among other large institutions, have, have, have gotten into. This is becoming the next conversation. Can you talk a little bit about why you all got involved in that? So we, we started pretty early, and we're very fortunate to have on the campus some real leaders in online technology and distance education, uh, one of whom uh, Rich Baranek likes to say that everything beyond the third row is distance education. And there's a real truth to that, right? If you're sitting passively in a class, what's the value of that time? And so I think this is great really for two reasons for Rice. One is this will transform what goes on inside the classroom on campuses because we can use this technology to much more efficiently deliver certain parts of our education and therefore use the time that professors have with students to engage in much more valuable kinds of interaction 
with those students. Give me an example of something that, uh, that, that a platform like edX enables you to do that you can't currently do on this campus. So it enables you to deliver substantive content in many ways offline, what's called the, really the flipped classroom. So when the students go home at night, they listen to the lectures, sometimes they, they can interact and you can get feedback before the class the next morning about what they're not understanding. And then you, in the class you can focus on what they actually had trouble with. Now what happens, they may or may not do the reading, you go into class and you have no idea as a teacher what they've already understood or not understood. So the first thing is a more efficient use of time. And if you look at the design of sort of today's classroom, it's not the sort of auditorium set up for passive learning. It's what I call sort of we're importing the model of early elementary school education into higher education. Do you remember all those little round tables and chairs and little tiny chairs and things? It's just like that, only the chairs and tables are a little bigger for our students. But really you're encouraging, I sat in on one of these classes the other day and the professor can get up there, pose a problem, and then the people around the table can work collaboratively on the problem. And one of the things that industry tells us, for example, is our students are really smart and they're thrilled to hire them, but what they are not used to doing is working in teams. And in fact, our whole structure is set up in many ways to discourage that, right? Yep. If, you, if you impermissibly collaborate, right, you're responsible and guilty of um, dishonest academic conduct. And so we have to change our mindset a little bit and say, look, collaboration. Not just you, but higher education. Higher education yep. and collaboration. We think we're, because of our low student faculty ratio, particularly well situated for this world. Yep. And so, Having that ability in the classroom, leaving the more passive learning to outside the classroom and letting it occur on the student's own time at night and come into the classroom having already done that, and maybe having responded to questions so the professor says, I can see from what you did last night that you're having problems in these two areas. Right? That I think is gonna change. But the other part of that, which I th we are equally excited about at Rice, is the ability to take what we do on this campus with our incredibly talented professors. It's like all we produce every year, this marvelous education, and yet up till now, the benefits of that have been confined to the people who we can accept to participate in an on-campus education yeah. at Rice. This gives us the opportunity to invite participants from around the world. Our first MOOC, which was done with Coursera, not, not edX, had about 90,000, 80,000 80, students enrolled in it. It was rated the best MOOC and what, what, in the what, country. I'm now curious, what was it specifically? It was on Python, which is a, as I understand, Pro programming language. A programming language right, yeah. for games, apparently. I'm surprised my son didn't sign up for this course. Um, but the point is, so it's Rice a, professors teaching it. Rice professors and teaching it. And anybody around the world able to access it. Really, dedi a de incredibly dedicated group of Rice professors, not satisfied with just getting a course out right. there, wanting the highest quality course, good arrangement for feedback students. 80,000, that's well in excess of the entire number of students who have attended Rice. In total. In its entire history. Right. And what's the economic model to support this? The theoretically, every president, everybody in your situation has to think, okay, I get what the content model is, but what's the economic model? How do we monetize this? Awful word. <laughs> but we all, we all have to say it occasionally. Um, that's pretty unsettled and I think is going to involve, I think one of the things emerging are certificates. That is, it's one thing for somebody to take a course. It's a different thing for them to right. have, be given some recognize the acknowledgement that they've completed the course. It's yet another thing, of course, to give them a, a greater evaluation in the course. Do you provide them with course materials? There, there are a whole range of ways in which eventually- So there may be an a la carte menu of people who want to essentially audit the class. They can just basically lurk yeah. and watch the, the course being taught, but you may be able to ramp up your involvement by paying a certain amount of money. And, and we may find some number of years from now, now that even just sort of auditing the course is not for free. That's the way the industry yeah. is starting, but it may change. One of the criticisms of these massive online open courses and this edX initiative and others is that it cheapens the course of study of a student who does it in person. So that if you allow people to essentially complete a degree program, if that's the ultimate goal here, entirely online, 
that somehow the value of that degree is not the same as what the value of the degree would be if you had, be, if you had attended the school through a traditional Well, it's a different, it's a different opportunity. Again, if we have 4,000 institutions of higher education, yep. ranging from community colleges to large research universities, why should we expect that in an institution, every kind of degree we provide is exactly the same? same. Right. We have all kinds of degrees. We have full-time students, part-time students. You know, my own view is we should be really excited about this additional opportunity. Is it the same as an on-campus opportunity? No, it's not. Is it gonna force the on-campus education to be even better because we're gonna to have to explain to people why, what the difference is between doing an online degree for whatever an online degree ends up costing, 10, 20, $30,000 as compared to the 160,000? We're gonna to have to be able to explain to people what you get out of the on-campus education. I have to say, for Rice, I have no worries about that. I know what we contribute to our students. But that doesn't mean that I'm not thrilled and that it's not a great benefit to people all around the world to be able to sit at home and go through our courses and become, become smarter. Yep. And who knows what other opportunities that will lead to. In some cases, it's going to lead to on-campus opportunities. When you look out and you see you've had 80,000 people take a course, and of that 80,000, Five people who took that course, you've never seen anybody this brilliant in your entire history of teaching, you're going to want to reach out and connect to them. It may people. become a prospecting tool and it may become a marketing tool, quite frankly, for the university. It, it's going to connect people to universities in different ways right. and also through that to employers in different ways. And yep. this whole kind of environment is going to become probably more connected, more transparent. And again, I think of these as as opportunities. I, I have to say for Rice, I don't really feel much threatened by this. I do think there are institutions because if what's occurring on your campus is not a lot better than what you can get online, you ought to feel real threatened by this. Right. And I think for us, A, I don't feel threatened, and B, I think it's a great opportunity to get even better. At this is the do. direction that higher ed is going in any case, so. The, the, the world is changing. I think it will change a little less rapidly. You, you know, you get a new technology. People get very excited. They love words like disruptive technologies. Uh, our, our institutions, uh, Rice has only been around 100 years. You know, when, he, when we had our centennial, uh, we had a great panel of university uh, presidents and chancellors, ranging from universities that have been started within the past decade to the rector from the University of Bologna, which had just celebrated its 924th anniversary. Right. So this is going to be an evolutionary process. It's not going to be an overnight change. Right. Let me, uh, I mentioned in my intro, uh, uh, President, uh, about your relationship with Houston. Uh, Rice, one thing that you've taken, uh, I think, a great deal of pride in is the degree to which the university and Houston have, have joined forces over, over, over your tenure. Why, why is that important? In some ways, you know, you're not a Houston university, you're a university that happens to be in Houston, or that would at least seem to be your brand. Well, we are an urban university, and Houston is our city, and it, it's a great city. Um, you know, when Rice was started, we were, you know, on the outskirts uh, of the city, and basically, uh, my vice president for public affairs who's sitting over there doesn't like me to say this, but basically put on swampland on the outskirts of the city 100 years ago, now we are literally three miles from the center of Houston. That's the same distance as Penn is or so from the center of Philadelphia or Columbia is uh, from the center of New York City. We are an urban university. And so we sit at two intersections in my view. One is between being a major research university and yet relatively small and having this uh, special commitment to undergraduate education that for our students often makes us feel like a liberal arts college, except with all the opportunities a research university right. provides. And the other, we have this beautiful wooded 300 acre campus, which has almost one tree for every student, sitting three miles from the center of the fourth largest city in the country. Right. What that city means, and the city promotes itself as meaning, is it means opportunity, and not just job opportunity, but opportunity for our students. And one of the things that I like to say about Rice, which is different than a lot of urban universities, was that if you took Rice off the map of Houston and said, 
you could put the university back wherever in the city you wanted to put it, you would actually put it back exactly where it is. Why? At one end of the campus, we have the Texas Medical Center, the largest medical center in the world, and all of the opportunities that provides. At the other end of the campus, we have the Museum District, really a phenomenal district with some of the great museums of this country. Even the Menil Collection is really within a sort of healthy walking distance of our campus. All of those incredible opportunities across the street, uh, Herman Park, largest park in the city, yep. you really couldn't ask for a better environment than our students have here. And with the light rail, and we give our students what we call a passport to Houston, and as I like to explain, that's not because when I came to Texas, I thought of it as a foreign country. Uh, it's we, we really want to get our students out into the city. The city means experience and opportunity with its industry, with its not-for-profit organizations, right. with all the needs. Um, I'm on this thing I call my rice walkabout, sort of just getting out to do different things with students and their activities and staff and faculty. And I went to an architectural dig in the fourth ward um, where our students are exploring kind of what's just beneath the surface out there, discovering artifacts, not ancient artifacts, but artifacts from early in the 20th century, basically. And this is great for the, for the people who live there, learning more about their history. It's great for our students because some of those techniques are exactly the same techniques that they will apply when they go to Africa for the summer and engage in exploration of sites that are 1,000 years old. So the city is about opportunity. So I think it's very important that Houston see rice as an important piece of the fabric of the city, that we don't sit behind our hedges, that our faculty, students, and staff contribute to the city. We're very proud of the level of our United Way contribution, which despite our small size, puts us in uh, among the major contributors uh, to the city. What we do in K through 12 education in the city and in the state, uh, most people don't know this, we are the largest provider in the state of Texas of um, online uh, STEM materials for K through 12 education, mm. right? These were developed here at Rice, drawing on a, a large group of talent. Uh, we have a new center, the Houston Education Research Consortium, which working with uh, HISD and, and other areas is intended to doing better understanding of what works in education, the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. These are ways that we can contribute to a home city that has been great for us, and ways that we can bring our students more opportunities. Well, and in fact, a lot of universities, big and small these days, are reaching down into the public schools to start earlier at helping to identify kids who would be appropriate for their campuses, but more to message the concept of college as not this far-off goal, but almost a default. Yeah, very little of this is really to build our own pipeline. We, we have probably thousands of students, uh, you know, high school students and earlier right. who come on our campus Your pipe is full. every year. And what we really want to do is we, want to, we do want to inspire them about opportunity, that they too can be college students one day. When working with HISD right. and the charters, they need to come on a campus, experience what it's like, and kind of imagine themselves in that position. The future, as Steve, <laughs> as Steve Kleinberg likes to say, the future of the city is going to depend less and less on what's in the ground and more and more on what's between your ears. And Rice has a role to play for that, not only in the 18 years old and older students that we get, but also in bringing better education, yeah. better materials, better teacher training to the high schools. And well, well so, so you, you've made the case for the relationship you have with Houston. What about your relationship with Texas? Um, obviously, the conversation about higher ed in Texas is largely, not exclusively, but largely about big public universities. Yeah. There are not very many small elite colleges in the state. And so I wonder how you feel about Rice in the context of higher ed in Texas. Well, I think we play a very important role uh, as one of the, the three universities in Texas that are members of the Association of American Universities. That is the very highest piece of research universities. Membership in that group itself controversial over the last couple of years. Not by Rice, but just the whole concept of the AAU and outside groups having an influence on discussions of higher education. Surely you've heard all this. Yeah, I haven't actually heard so much about AAU sort of controversy. Um, but, but the point is that what goes on on our campuses, so one of the other things we're trying to do is 
we would like we got, do a lot of research here. That research can turn into applications and companies. And so we're trying to provide the right environment to develop businesses in Texas and keep businesses in Texas. Higher ed is a very pe good, important piece of that. Again, I've mentioned sort of the K through 12 education yep. has not been something confined to Houston, but has had a, had a broader impact across the state. Uh, so even though we are comparatively small, very small as compared to institutions like uh, UT and AMM and the University of Houston, we believe we have a pretty distinctive role. And each year we take in, I think in the entering class, roughly speaking, maybe about 400 students from Texas mm -hmm. or so. But I think even more important, because we are attracting some of the most talented students from all, literally across the world, many of those students actually decide to stay in Texas. You know, when you, it's one of the amazing things about Houston in particular, you go into any environment and half the people are immigrants. And I don't mean necessarily from other countries, but like myself have come from other states because of what Houston and the state have to offer. Right. And one thing that I've observed over the years is even for the students, say, who come from New York or Pennsylvania or California, who don't immediately decide to stay in Houston or Texas, they later in life, they are much more likely to be willing to come to Houston or Texas Having spent the because time they've here. been here. Right. Speaking of your immigrant roots, and I speak as an immigrant myself uh, from the same place that you came from, uh, you've been here now eight years. Uh, you were a, a dean of the Law School of Columbia. You had been a practicing lawyer some time ago. You clerked. Your life was in the law before, not so much in university administration. Um, why were you prepared for this job by that? <laughs> what, what, what made you the right, the right choice given your background? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know what made me the right choice. I was told that the search committee, you know, which had trustees and faculty and students and a staff member, that the only thing that they had agreed on from the beginning of the search was no lawyers. Um, and, how, how, how'd that work out for them? Uh, I don't know that worked out terribly yeah, well. Right, right. Um, you know, in some ways, having been dean of a law school and coming to a comparatively small university, I actually felt pretty well prepared. And one of the things I really like is being able to maintain some level of contact with students, with faculty, really get out there and sort of meet people. I'm sometimes amazed by the number of faculty that I've gotten to know during my time here. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that really makes the job interesting and exciting. You know, sitting up there just in an office all day long and not having a good sense of what students are doing. And I mentioned this walkabout thing earlier. And, you know, often I would try to, go, say, go to a, a play that the students have put on. But, but as part of this, what I've gotten to do is go to rehearsals. And when you go to a rehearsal, you really see what people are putting into this yep. activity and how important it is and, and the range of things that they're really getting out of it. I think one reason you see a pretty respectable number of lawyers as leaders of institutions of higher ed, one, law schools are intellectually amazingly diverse institutions. They're almost like mini universities. And so it's not like sort of we have a very narrow perspective. If you've run a major law school to the extent that anyone can be said to run an educational institution. Uh, if, you've, if you've done that, you, you really have worked with this vast range of methodolo methodological perspectives and disciplines. Uh, so I think that's one kind of preparation. And the other thing about lawyers is we sort of, academic lawyers have one foot in academia and kind of one foot in the wor real world. We tend to be relatively practical people. Yep. And these institutions at this time, in my view, do require fairly practical leadership. You've done this for eight years? Eight and a half. I don't know what the average tenure for a person in your job is, but I wonder if you're beginning to think time will come on to the next thing. Well, you... the, the time, time will come in some number of years, but... Um, Not on your radar screen yet. You know, it's been, uh, my family has been extremely happy here in, in Houston. I, I worried a little bit when my daughter started saying things like, all y'all. Um, <laughs> all y'all, as you know, is plural for y'all. Well, I, I, got, I got that. I'm sure she's figured um, that out. But, right. but Houston, Houston, if I could, you know, Houston has been for us a remarkably welcoming city. You know, when I came from New York, people said, well, what's it like to come from New York to, to Houston? And my response was that the cities are actually a lot alike. They're both very dynamic, very diverse, Nobody cares whether you were born here. Nobody cares when you got here. 
The difference is in Houston, they're actually glad that you're here. And <laughs> this, I think for that reason, has been just a, a, a great city for us. And although I'm proud of what we've done over the last eight and a half years, uh, I'm very excited by what I see ahead in the opportunities, building deeper relationships with the institutions in the Texas Medical Center yep. and the museums, the museum district, really bringing this technology. And you know, our, our faculty really enthusiastically embrace the opportunity with edX. Uh, we have a great faculty uh, senate here at Rice. And so there's a real sense of community and a lot of challenges ahead. If, if I felt everything had been done or that, that I couldn't contribute more, then I'd be looking for the next opportunity. But not yet. But, uh, but I, I think it's a great time to be here at Rice. OK. Let's, uh, let's use the balance of our time uh, for questions. We may have a few employees who want to ask you questions. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> or, some, or some general community well, members. As long as, they're, as long as they're not about parking, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> Evan, thank you. David. Fascinating conversation. I'd like to go back to something you said a little bit earlier, because we have a lot of people here who are looking at the other side of the transition from high school to college while you're looking at it as they come in. Your numbers are stunning. The numbers of applicants you have for the numbers of freshman spots, and then to hear you say later, 400 of them are usually in-state. It seems to me that that creates a tremendous circumstance for your admissions department. Could you talk a little bit about how you build a freshman class great and what question. those characteristics that, that you look for for students coming to this great university are? Well, how do you build it? And specifically, how do you build a diverse class? Because obviously, you don't want 400 of the absolute smartest kids. You want a well-rounded class, right? Yeah, I, I, uh, it's a great question. And I'm glad you put it the way you put it, because which is how do you build a class? And I, I think there's a real misunderstanding out there, this, the, this sense that somehow you can build a rank order of your 15,000 applicants and just go right down that list and you know, just until you fill your class. And that's not what we're actually trying to do. We're trying to do a lot of different things. We do think having this diversity in our class is central to our ed education. And so uh, first of all, you know, Unless you can succeed at Rice academically, you're, you're not going to get in. So, uh, and that's looking at high school performance and looking at SAT scores or ACT scores and really getting a sense of whether somebody has what it takes to succeed. And that, that's a fairly you know, substantial range of people. Some are going to have perfect SATs. We don't admit everybody with perfect SATs to Rice. We could pretty much fill the class with people with perfect SATs. But First of all, the person with perfect SATs isn't even always the smartest person, actually, if that's what you're trying to measure. There are a lot of things that go into an assessment of drive and intellect and breadth and accomplishment. And so we are looking at standardized tests. We are looking at their performance as high school students. And we're pretty careful about that. So we look at the rigor of the courses they took, at the rigor of the high school. Uh, is the high school sending a lot of people to colleges, not sending a lot of people to colleges? Are they taking honors courses or not taking honors courses? We have a very careful approach to that. We look at recommendations. Uh, what are people saying about this candidate? We look at their accomplishments. Uh, we look at uh, what are the range of things that they're doing? Uh, have they demonstrated leadership? Right? Have they participated in athletics or music? In, Certain parts of the university, such as architecture and the music school, they were looking for very specialized talents, right? And, and if you want to be a student in our music school, you actually have to come and do an audition if you're lucky enough to be selected to get the audition, which alone is a pretty high standard. So we're looking to bring together in each class 950 people who together are going to create the most interesting educational environment on this planet. That is our goal. And we think we get pretty close to that, to that goal. And that means that you're going to be sitting down, that is you as a student, and having lunch or dinner with people from all across the world, people who are incredibly shy, people who are incredibly outgoing, people whose life is about music, and people whose life is about physics, uh, people who uh, people who don't believe in God, and people for whom their religion is the most important force in their lives. And I think that's what makes a college education 
in some ways, truly profound. And that's what you can't get on the internet, in my view. You can't get that just by communicating with people. It's having those people, and sometimes, and perhaps most importantly, people with whom you disagree about many things become your best friends. And tech said this to David's point about the 400 out of the 950, is that right? Texanness is just one attribute of many that you consider. So you're not necessarily trying to build a class that is, ex is roughly half Texans and half non. It's just one thing to consider. Yeah, and question. you know, on none of these things do we have quotas. If the Texas number goes up a little one year and down a little next, you know, uh, we had a lot of success in California recently, for example. So we're pretty flexible about that. We've seen huge demand come out of China in terms of students who'd like to study in the yeah. United States. We're very flexible about that. And some of the things we don't actually know about, right? You, they aren't necessarily revealed in the application. You're just hoping that you're getting this very, um, again, diverse, interesting group. And one of the things we actually pride ourselves at Rice is that our environment will bring out things in people that they didn't really know about or expect. When I was doing this tour and talking to the students involved in theater and I, watching somebody perform on stage, and, I'd, I'd ask him, uh, you know, did you do theater in high school? And, and he answers, no, it never occurred to me. I was too shy. And I think that's one of the special things about our environment that we see over and over again is it supports that emergence of new aspirations and new talents. Other questions for the president? Ma'am. Hi, uh, President. Uh, I'm a grad student here at MLS. And I'm also a GSA member, and I just want to thank the university for the support of the GLBT community. I'm in Rice Ally, and uh, I wanted your perspective about grad programs. I know we're mostly K through 12, but our mission is to get students into post-secondary education. But how is Rice uh, preparing their undergrads to go on to um, grad school, postdoc, uh, law school, and and uh, so on? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a very interesting question because, in fact, most of our students are going to go on to further school. Uh, we have a lot of students who choose to go into the medical professions, and it's a, a range of uh, medical professions. I, I met a student the other day whose passion is to be a physical therapist. We send a lot of students to, to med schools, and many of them, thankfully, just across the street uh, to, to medical schools. We send students to law school. Ultimately, many of our students do go to business school, though most business schools prefer to have students who first get some experience. But on a per capita basis that is adjusted for size, Rice is one of the largest providers of graduate students in STEM fields, that is science, engineering, uh, mathematics. And we also inspire students who go on to graduate study in areas like history and religious studies and economics and political science and sociology. I uh, met a student the other day who'd you know, come in fully intending to be a doctor and uh, as she was getting educated, she decided that you know, she was more interested in looking at other ways to contribute to society and decided sociology was what she was really interested in. I do think it's one of the advantages of being a research university is you can draw the students into participating into the research and being inspired by their professors. And again, Rice sits at that wonderful intersection where people get to know their professors and also see the major research that they're doing. So although we often sort of talk about undergraduate education and our distinctive commitment to it, which is very different than saying that, that it's sort of a priority, Graduate student education is just as important to us as a university. You cannot be a top-tier research university without good graduate education as well. So we try to bring those two things together, and you know, happily we find that we inspire many of our students to go on to study as well. Sir. Yes, hi, I'm Zach Codges, Houston Community College. <clears throat> Appreciate the plug for community colleges. And uh, you know, what I want to do is just uh, reemphasize the importance of our uh, research universities and our, you know, our tier one uh, universities. I read an article recently about China and China moving away from standardized tests and again exploring how we do a university education here in this country because they're good at making things but they're not good at creating things. And our universities are where that occurs. And you know, the, our country has always had the next big idea. Right. 
and most of those big ideas have come from the university. So, but as you know, uh, President, good, good, good question. And you know, President, the you, you and I ought to go out as a team, and I can say how great you are. Go you on the road. Great. There's been a lot of tension in, in the discussion about the value of research. It's been part of this higher education reform debate. We say that we overemphasize the value of research, underemphasize the importance of actually teaching students and bringing in tuition dollars. We were the entire last legislative session was was captured by that conversation. Well, we ought to be very worried about killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. I, I spend a lot of time in China, and so I, I've gotten to observe firsthand what is going on with universities in, in China. And uh, we still have the best uh, system, if it is a system, of higher education in the world. But if we don't sustain these universities and their ability to create generation after generation of creative leaders and thinkers, um, we will fall behind. Uh, we had a dinner in our house at which the, vice, the then vice minister of higher education from China was present, and she was in charge of all higher education in China. And what, what she said to me, and apparently said a very similar thing to Tom Friedman, is she, said, she said, you know, don't try to catch us on instilling purely substantive knowledge into students, you know, feeding them substantive knowledge. You know, we know how to do that. But what we haven't been able to figure out is how to foster creativity and innovation. And that's what we are really good at. You know, one of the things we're proud of on the campus is a kind of uh, renewed engagement with the arts. And I, I hope for those of you who haven't been on recently on our campus, you take a little bit of time. You go out this door, to your left is the Terrell, uh, which you ought to go, go in, even if you're not there for the, the light show. And take a little walk down there, you'll see the, the piece by Jaume Plenza called Mirror, which is especially beautiful at, at night. And why are we so committed to the arts? Because there's a connection with creativity and imagination. And that's what our universities have been really great at. If you start trying to pull out the research piece and you don't find something to replace it, this country will fall behind. That's, that's, that's not a threat, it is a prediction. If you look at what co has come out of the universities, and it's not just kind of short-term leaders, uh, short-term research rather. You know, industry can carry on research which has short-term goals, but it's fundamental research. When you go in and have an MRI, right, and when you think back, this is sort of predates me, what did they do before the MRI? Well, they cut you open to see what was inside. That was pretty dangerous for people to do that. How did we end up with the MRI? Did we end up because somebody said, we need a better kind of x-ray machine? No, we ended up with the MRI because we wanted to be began by understanding matter at its most fundamental level. Fundamental knowledge builds advancement. It does matter where those discoveries occur. And this idea of simply putting that aside, in my view, is a very large mistake. Texas has a great opportunity here, has a great opportunity to become even more of a leader in fundamental research, applied research, all of the things. We have all of these great institutions in the state. It would be, in my view, a very big mistake to cut back on the support that we provide research and research universities. Take a last one if there is one, otherwise we'll. Um, Joanne Salazar, um, I wanted to expand on the question that this gentleman had asked about what you look for in students as you admit them into Rice. And what I didn't hear you say was state mandated testing. Like do you ever look right. at <laughs> tax results or in other states, some of them give tests. Do you ever look at state mandated tests? Ms. Ms. Salazar is with, with a group <laughs> that has a point of view on testing, let's, let's just say. <laughs> did, I, did I say that diplomatically enough? Thank you, yeah. yes. I, I, and I don't even know what your point of view is, but, but I, I would say I've- see, see if you can guess. I have never heard, <laughs> I have never heard of anybody looking at a tax, a tax test. You know, we do look at the SAT, it carries substantial weight. Um, I don't think the SAT is perfect, it's got a number of problems. Like any kind of testing, used appropriately and used in context. I think that one of the problems with testing, in my view, and it's getting a little outside 
people will teach to the test. People are smart, right? And if you tell them this is what you'll be measured on, and what, I, what we worry about, and we worry about in school financing, you know, just as we think music and art and all a broad education is important to our students, it is in many ways even more important for very young children to expand that sense of capability. You know, I see that in my daughter at home, her interest in art, the connection between the imagination required for art and the imagination required for science, all the different ways we have to communicate with each other. So, so uh, you know, our, as far as I know, SAT and the ACT, those are what we use. They're different kinds of tests. They have their limitations. And, you know, every, every university has the uh, stories. I certainly had it when I was at Columbia Law School, yep. and I, we have it here. You know, the very last person in your class that you admitted, you know, they barely squeaked off the wait list. They turn out to be the superstar. You know, <clears throat> we're doing the best we can, but in my view, at least at our level, it is not about finding more tests to look at. And so you don't feel, I, I want to reiterate that then from as far as testing is concerned, <laughs> That you don't think, um, if we over-test, do you think that helps with innovation and creativity, or is that stifling? You're going to get an award from Tamsa before this is <laughs> over. I'll I, 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 you're, I don't know if you're trying to drag me into some <laughs> debate that I don't want to be in. Uh, le let, me just let me just say, there's an amb ambiguity to over-test, what testing means, right? So um, you don't want to over-test, except that actually giving students constant feedback actually turns out to be a really good thing. And so sometimes there's actually under-testing. Standardized tests actually have some very good things about them. You sort of want to know what are you accomplishing and how do one set of schools compare to the other schools. Like anything else in this world, anything, it can be indulged in to excess. I mean, I think chocolate chip cookies are the world's perfect food. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But you can do it to excess. Too many is too many. Is too many. All right, well, we're going to stop here. Uh, President, thank you very much for having us on your campus. Thanks for taking time with us, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.